Okay, hi Chris, and thank you so much for hosting me today. Um, I hope you guys can see me um, and see my presentation. So please type in the chat, yes, if yes, and don't type anything if no, because I hope you can. Um, <laughs> so um, I'll just go into things and try and leave uh, as much time as possible for questions. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about everything you need to know to get into a top 10 MBA program. Um, we're going to try and aim this presentation for people who are applying in 2021. If you are aiming to apply in 2020, you know, make the adjustments, but basically start getting uh, start getting going with the applications. Um, and if you're applying in 2000 or thinking of applying for 2022, well, plenty of time. Well done for planning ahead. Let's start. Um, just a bit about myself. Um, so I'm a London Business School graduate. I have an undergraduate in computer science. Before London Business School, I used to be a programmer in a big high tech company for a couple of years. After London Business School, I went to consulting for about a year and a half. And then I went to, um, big, some, to work for some big IT companies in business development roles. And I've been working at Oringo full time for the last five years. Additionally, when I graduated from London Business School, I was asked to be part of the interviewing committee, which means I used to interview uh, candidates for London Business School. I think I interviewed approximately 50 or 60 candidates you know, over the years, so I was quite busy with that. Um, so I think I have a bit of the perspective both of an applicant and of an interviewer um, and what schools are looking for. Cool, let's dive into the presentation. Um, this is the only marketing presentation I have, uh, marketing slide. Um, I work for Ringo MBA Admissions Consulting. Ringo is a very good firm. We've been going on for 15 years um, and we help people get into MBA programs. This is the only thing we do. We've been doing it for a while. You can see our stats. You can also see them online. Please visit oringo.com. Um, again, you can see our statistics. You can see any other information there. Let's dig into the presentation. So I'm gonna try and answer you know, everything I can. Um, hopefully they'll, uh, <laughs> um, I will be able to go over some of the uh, things that are bothering you or that you're not sure about. Um, but obviously you can also ask me questions throughout the presentation. Um, Chris will try and assign them to me. So hopefully I'll actually see those questions. Um, so feel free again to, to write me any question during the presentation. And obviously, I'm going to try and rush through the presentation so we have lots of time at the end of the presentation to, um, um, to uh, go into uh, more of your questions. OK, so why do a top 10 MBA? Um, you know, I speak to a lot of people and I ask them the question, why do you want to do a top 10 MBA? And it's strange that people sometimes tell me, well, I, I just want to do it. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but I just want to do it. Or I've been thinking of a top 10 MBA for a while. And then I asked them, great, why? And then they're not exactly sure. So to be honest, most of the people that I speak to are people who want to do a top 10 MBA for career switching purposes. If you're a lawyer and you do great stuff, but you don't really want to do that for the rest of your life, or an accountant or a programmer who's doing a lot of technical stuff like I was doing, but wants to move to business related um, positions, or a complete career shift and wants to be an investment banker, et cetera. So most of the people I speak to and most of the people who will go to a top 10 MBA full-time program um, will do it from career switching reasons. And that's a very popular reason. Um, the second reason to go into a top 10 MBA program is for career acceleration. So you work in a bank, you're some kind of position and you want to jump to the next level or even to the next next level and to have some kind of added edge on your peers. And obviously a top 10 MBA program might give you that added edge. I was actually giving a presentation not long ago um, in one of the EY offices. So EY is, a, as probably most of you know, uh, a very big accounting and financial services firm. And I brought there one of the candidates I worked with uh, a few years ago, and he used to be an EY accountant. He went to an MBA did one year in investment banking and went back to the same office that he was before the MBA. And he gave his example 
So at EY, every year you jump a level in terms of your, um, you, you kind of get a promotion um, and your title changes. I don't remember the titles, but just for the sake of this discussion, you start as a junior analyst, then you're an analyst, then you're a senior analyst, then you're a manager, then you're a senior manager, project manager, senior, senior, something else. And he gave the example that after three years, so again, he did a two-year MBA, plus one year after that in another role and then came back to EY, he actually jumped uh, six years in terms of the seniority. So that's a good example of someone who liked what he was doing, but wanted to accelerate quicker or have some kind of edge on his peers. The third reason of doing an MBA, again, I'm just rushing through this quickly, um, is if you know you wanna be a, an entrepreneur in the future. Now, if you guys know what you want to do, if you know, if you have an idea of an amazing app, and you want to develop that idea, um, and you know exactly what you want to do, go and do it. Don't go and do an MBA. Go to your parents', get parents garage and <laughs> develop your startup. But if you just know you want to be um, a future entrepreneur, but you're not sure exactly what, um, well, in that case, an MBA is a good idea because it does give you a very wide um, perspective, a very wide array of skills, a very wide uh, background, business background that can help you in the future. So, um, uh, aha, I got my first question. Um, so great, I'm not gonna mention names of people who ask me questions, but you're my star. And the question is regarding an online MBA. That's a great question. Um, so most of my presentation will, will discuss top 10 full-time MBAs. Um, can you get these attributes from, from an online MBA? Well, hang on with me for just you know, if, you know, a few more slides and we'll talk about what you get out of a top 10 MBA. And then I'll try and quickly answer the, you know, I'll try and um, uh, answer the same attributes for the online MBA. So very good question, let me, let me address that. I did put here uh, academia. And if one of your uh, ambitions in life or you know, future ambitions is to be some kind of a professor in a university and give lectures about business. An MBA is not the right degree for you because an MBA, again, it, it might work, but I'm just saying, in my opinion, go for another degree that has a thesis, a thesis, go for a PhD program. There's no reason going for an MBA that doesn't have a thesis that usually doesn't lead to more advanced degrees and is a very practical degree towards your professional life. So I actually put here academia in green, but I would, I would actually put it in red and think, is this the right degree for me if that's my ambition in life? Um, okay, so again, that's great. I wanna be one of those, but why should I choose a you know, top 10 MBA to do one of those? Well, first of all, you know, the salaries are very high. I'll show them soon, so you can you know, earn a lot of money. Um, another reason is it's a very good way for career switching. And like, uh, um, like I said before, probably most of the people that do a top 10 MBA are thinking of career switching. Another thing is international experience. You know, these MBAs are in the US or in Europe or in you know, some other countries that we'll discuss. And first of all, it's, you know, it's a fantastic experience to go and live in these countries during the degree, but also these MBAs will open you uh, opportunities, employment opportunities, to keep living in these countries or in other international countries. And again, you might be able to do this with your current career progress, um, but I sometimes speak to um, very successful professionals and they might even have um, some kind of a citizenship or, or visa to go and live in the US. But I tell them, great, so you're a lawyer from Poland and you have a, you have a visa, you can go to the US and then you'll say, hi, I'm here, <laughs> but you know, that's great, but who will give you, you know, a good employment? Hi, I'm here. Um, but on the other hand, if you're a lawyer from Poland and you go and you do an, your MBA at Columbia University and then do your internship at McKinsey and then you do your second year and you, you know, take lots of courses in finance, that puts you in another place when the recruiters come to campus to recruit you. So I'm gonna discuss the recruitment um, um, in about three or four slides. So just a very quick, just a very quick, I want this all to be in the same, on the same level. I keep mentioning top 10 MBA. Um, I just wanted to kind of mention what are the top 10 MBA programs. 
So this is a great slide because whoever counts very quickly can actually see that there's 15 MBAs here on this slide. And these are just some of the US programs. And by the way, I just went through the slide and I was saying, actually, where's Duke? That's a top 10 MBA. And where is North Carolina? That's a top 10 or top 12 MBA. So in the US, there's actually quite a lot of very, very good MBA programs and definitely more than 10. And the reason I count all of them as top 10 MBAs is there's just more than one ranking. <laughs> so it's a bit strange, but there's probably about 15 to 20 top 10 MBA programs in the US. Luckily in Europe, there's, there's probably less. Um, and most of you know most of these brands. So I, I don't want to go into uh, all of them, but actually I'll do it very quickly. Um, so I, I just want to also kind of set your expectations a bit when you go and, and want to apply to a top 10 MBA. I have to tell you that about 50, 60% of the people I talk to say to me, and there's two schools I would really like to study at. And those schools are usually, guess, drum roll, Harvard and Stanford, okay? Now, it's not just that those 50 or 60% really want to study at Harvard and Stanford. These are two very sought after schools. Um, I think Stanford had 7% acceptance rate last year and Harvard just a bit more, I think it was maybe 11%. These are very tough schools to get into. So keep that in mind if these are the only schools you're thinking of, keep it in mind that a lot of other people are mainly thinking about these schools. Um, and you might want to consider some other schools as well. In the top schools, again, Stanford's an amazing school, a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of strategy, um, a lot of, uh, obviously it's in Silicon Valley and in California, so a lot of tech, um, very good, good school, Harvard, obviously great school. Um, they're usually looking for the people to manage the world, looking for managers, uh, general management, strategy, finance, lots of that in those schools. Now, there's some other schools with a lot of stigmas. So for example, Wharton, Chicago, Columbia are very finance oriented. This perhaps was true a few years ago. I have to tell you that in Columbia Business School, there's a lot of tech. In Chicago, there's a lot of marketing and strategy. Wharton have everything, okay? Healthcare, tech, marketing, consulting, finance as well. So a lot of these schools have everything um, in them. And uh, th there's definitely something called school specialization, but I would also take other factors into account because most schools have you know, nearly every single specialization. Um, there are some other schools where I speak to candidates and they sometimes don't, don't know these names or don't think they have a good enough brand recognition. For example, Darden, Virginia, uh, Dartmouth Talk, uh, Cornell, Duke, UCLA, Yale, um, NYU. These are very good schools. They're all ranked between seven to 12 in nearly every single ranking in the world. Um, you will probably get to the same employer at the same salary from these schools as from the top three or four schools. So have those schools in mind as well. It's sometimes easier to get into a school um, which is in a less attractive area, with all due respect to North Carolina and Duke, or um, you know, to Michigan Ross, than uh, Columbia or Stanford, um, because they're just in less, you know, they're not in big cities, but these schools are, are amazing schools and you can get to the same employers and the same salaries and have the same career goals. and have a very good MBA uh, experience overall. I'll just quickly go over the schools in Europe. So in Europe, there's uh, less uh, very, very good schools uh, than in the US. Um, and again, uh, when I speak to candidates, they will usually tell me, and there's two schools I really want to study at at Europe. Usually they will mention NCAD in London. NCAD is a fantastic school. It's based in France. Um, so a very good school for people who want to be, uh, who want to stay in their current job or career uh, because the studies are just 10 months and then you can very fast go back to your you know, previous life. Uh, London Business School is a bit longer and the degree is around a year and a half. It's a bit flexible. Um, main difference between the schools, again, is gonna be the location. Okay, so the uh, professors move from school to school. They are very, very similar uh, clubs, very similar courses, and a very big difference would be that London is just, you know, in the center of, you know, a huge city, 
and NCAD will be in the middle of nowhere in a nice forest in France. Now there's advantages for both. So you have to think about that a bit, about the location. Uh, Cambridge and Oxford are great schools that uh, you know, most of us know the names of Cambridge and Oxford because they're known for a lot of other things as well. And the other schools in Europe are also very good school. Uh, it's okay if you haven't heard of them. What's important is that the employers have heard of them. And the reason that you may have not heard of all the European top schools are they only do MBA programs. They're business schools. So HEC Paris, for example, is a very good school. But uh, a lot of you may have not heard of them, of, of HEC, because they only do MBAs. They don't do law or they don't do uh, medicine. So the, top, the other top schools in Europe are HEC Paris, ESA in Barcelona, which is a great school, um, IE Madrid, ISADE in Barcelona, and IMD Switzerland. There are one or two other schools. Obviously, they're good as well, Bocconi or Rotterdam. But in most rankings, these would be the top nine schools. There are lots of other programs, um, for example, programs for more senior candidates, programs for younger candidates, programs for candidates with tech uh, experience. Um, just shoot me out a quick email after this uh, presentation, and I'll, you know, if you give me your background, I'll just tell you which schools to look out for. Um, but most of my presentation will discuss regular two-year programs. Now, I just added a slide recently because a lot of people say. Well, I'm not sure, you know, I just want a top school. I'm not exactly sure what is the difference between Europe and the US. So I just decided to put some, you know, bullets around that. So like we discussed in the US, most of the schools are famous for everything. So I haven't checked out Harvard's um, law ranking, but I'm assuming their law school is one of the best. I haven't checked out Harvard's medical school ranking, but I'm assuming it's one of the best. And same goes with Columbia and same goes with Duke University. These are very famous schools. And if you've watched movies, you've probably seen some of these schools in the movies because someone studied at one of these famous schools, um, which is very different than the EU schools because apart from Oxford and Cambridge, all these universities mainly do MBA programs. And they have, you know, they have less brand presence if we're just discussing the general brand of the school. Again, What's important in my eyes is, do the employers know these schools? And the answer is they do. Second thing is the European schools tend to have a lot of international, so I put here foreigner uh, students within the university. And again, at London Business School, there's 90 plus percent foreigners. There aren't many British people at the school. NCA, there aren't many French people at the school, et cetera, et cetera. In the US schools, most of the class will be American. Is 60% or 70%, that depends on the school and the uh, percentage of foreigners will be less. Again, that's quite a different experience. Another thing is most of the European schools will be a year and a half, a year to a year and a half, or sorry, all the European schools will be one to one and a half years long uh, in terms of the MBA. Most of the American schools will be two years long MBA. Okay, some special programs will be one year, but most of the programs will be two years. The ultimate decision, and again, my next slide is how do you choose the, the, which MBA program to go for? would be location. Where do you want to live throughout the degree? And obviously, if you want to live in Europe, don't go and study in the US. And where do you want to work after the degree? And you know, although NCAD is a fantastic program, if you know you want to go and work in the Silicon Valley after your MBA, it's really, really a bad choice to go and study at NCAD and then go and look for a um, Silicon Valley uh, job. I'm not saying you won't succeed doing that, and I think 20% of NCAD graduates actually go and work in the US, but no one checked out of those 20% who worked in the US before, in which companies did they work, which industries did they come from, because those statistics are really complicated to start calculating. But I can tell you that even if you go to a second tier school in the US, you will for sure live in the US throughout the degree, right? That makes sense. And at a 90% chance, will work in the US after the degree. So, and, and vice versa, if you know you want to work and live in Europe, just go for a European school. So really this brings me nicely to the next slide. Um, and again, I'm just reminding you, if you have questions, I haven't forgotten the online MBA question, you can just um, write them throughout the presentation. I'll see them and I'll try and address them throughout the presentation or at the end. Um, so how do you choose? You know, How do you choose which business school do you apply to? And I would say the number one uh, criteria is location, location, location. Do you want to live in New York? Do you want to live on the East Coast? Do you want to live in Europe? 
where, okay, so that would be the number one difference between the schools because I kind of told you before, the professors move from school to school, the courses are very similar, the clubs are very similar. So the main difference would be the location. Obviously, there's other factors as well, like school ranking. If you want to go to, you know, the number three school or the number seven school. So yeah, I definitely see value in that. Some of the schools do have specialities. Okay, and again, I discussed Stanford before. You know, we think about the location. It's in the Silicon Valley. Uh, it definitely has a, a lot of tech, a lot of entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, I definitely, you know, see um, see differences between Stanford and Wharton, who's definitely a bit more finance, um, special specializes in finance and maybe consulting. Um, Another thing would be the recruiters. If you know what your job um, uh, career is and you know what you're looking for post MBA and you have a very, very specific employer that you're looking to target, for example, you want to work in Uber at the end of your MBA. Well, Uber is quite a big company, so I think they have headquarters in a lot of cities. Um, but let's say you want to work in a solar panel manufacturer. And we know that green, green energy and green tech is stronger in California than it is in London. Okay, so I think that means, or I think that gives you uh, emphasis on looking for schools in California. So definitely if there is a specific recruiter or if you have something specific that you're looking for, uh, I would advise you know, to try and look for schools that can, you know, are strong in that specific thing. Um, one or two other factors is maybe school culture. I tend to think that school culture is more to do with the location of the school. Because if the school is in a very big city, for example, New York, um, there's a lot of attractions in New York, right? So you might want to go and see a basketball game or a baseball game, or might want to go to a museum one night. And if the school is in a very small place with no museums, basketballs, or baseball <laughs> games, um, most of your most of your you know day to day or, or week to week would be around the university. So I'm not sure that school culture, well, that is school culture, but that, that kind of drives from the location of the school. Teaching methods, well, most of these universities, uh, most of the top universities use the case study based method. So it's, you know, you don't open your books in uh, page number 126 and read something. Usually you read about a case study. For example, how do EasyJet uh, price their tickets in Christmas? That's a very interesting case study. Um, how did um, um, how did London 2012 Olympics, uh, how did they decide on the pricing of the tickets for the Olympics? That's a very interesting case study. Uh, and so on. So usually you will read kind of a story and you know what happened and then you'll analyze that in the class. So that would be the case study method. Uh, moving on. So great. Um, I just wanted to kind of, this is another kind of slide I put in. And um, I thought about some myths. Now again, concentrate on the facts. There's so many myths in the MBA world. And for example, um, usually I ask this as a poll, but I'm, I'm not gonna trouble you. And I ask, you know, uh, which school alumni got the highest pay last year? Okay, so, you know, I ask this and everybody shouts, Stanford! And then, you know, I say no. So they say, ah, yeah, Harvard, Columbia, London. So actually last year, the highest pay was at MIT, okay? Now, it doesn't really matter that the MIT average salary was 161,355, and at Harvard, it was only 160,268, okay? Come on, this is the same average salary. And the only difference was that whoever did this poll, you know, checked 95 people from MIT who had a slightly higher salary than the 95 people they checked at Harvard or Stanford or Columbia. So this is just one myth to show you same school, uh, different schools, same result, right? Kind of the same average salary. Uh, another myth that I found was, you know, what are the first and second top ranked schools in Europe? Um, sorry, highest ranked, I meant in Europe. Uh, that's an interesting one to, to put in the world. And Usually people shout NCAD, and then I say, fine, what's the second one? They say London, I say, fine, what's the third one? Here people start uh, getting confused. You know, is it Oxford, is it Cambridge, is it Yes, in Barcelona? Now, you know, the answer is it really depends. There's so many rankings, okay? Do we look at QS, The Economist, 
uh, Financial Times, Business Week. So there's so many different rankings. I just took the Financial Times ranking. You know, it clearly says LBS is a top European school. HEC is the second one. Does that mean anything? Does that mean that LBS is better than HEC Paris? Does that mean that Cambridge isn't the number second, the number two school, or is not? So there's lots of myths out there. Okay, what you need to do is just concentrate on the facts. Where would you like to study? And again, the main difference would be the location. And then you can add the other factors to it. You know, uh, definitely what are the different rankings of that specific school, specialization. Um, but again. The, the, you know, kind of forget what you were <laughs> what you were thinking of initially, because sometimes the facts are very different. Okay, how much does an MBA cost? Well, it really costs a lot. Okay, if we look at the U.S., um, sorry, this is the slide that uh, usually hurts, um, and um, there's a lot of pain in this slide. Um, if we look at the U.S., again, most of the schools would cost around one hundred and forty thousand um, dollars, and you know that's a fortune. Again, a two-year MBA, one hundred and forty thousand dollars. Let's add to that uh, cost of living, easily, easily $200,000. Now, this is a sum that most of the students just don't have, okay? And I definitely understand that. Uh, the EU tuition, well, that would be a bit cheaper, around 80,000 uh, euros per year. Again, most of the programs are one year. Um, so if we're looking, you know, maybe together with uh, um, the cost of living, we're probably looking at around 100,000 euros, again, uh, huge amount of money, um, but uh, those are the costs. The good thing is there are ways to, uh, to pay for this MBA. So there are uh, four you know, types of uh, um, um, external money that you can uh, think of getting, again, if you don't have these sums right now in your current account. Um, and the first one is financial needs. So most of the schools, not everyone, most of the schools will have some kind of financial need uh, base uh, and they'll have money allocated for people. Um, and again, there's different forms that you can fill out uh, and um, different requests that you can do. Unfortunately, this can only be done after you get accepted to the school. So it's, I don't know if it's a chicken and egg or whatever, but you first have to get into the school and then you have to kind of understand how, how do you fund it. Um, the second way of getting uh, some kind of scholarship from the school, and this is probably the most popular way, is merit-based scholarships. Now, merit means you are very good at something specific, but it doesn't mean that you have a very high GPA or very high GMAT. It can mean anything, okay, that you come from a very attractive background or that you have a very interesting story to tell or that you have very good, you know, uh, scores in you know, some of the tests, um, but it can be one of them. So if you're a woman that comes from uh, Fiji and you work in a very interesting industry, that's a very interesting candidate for the schools. And therefore, I would say that on average, this woman's standardized uh, test can be a bit lower than average. But if you're a programmer and you come from a very uh, uh, not special background, sorry, I don't know how to <laughs> criteria that, and um, you want to apply to MIT, who get a lot of engineers that apply to MIT, you will probably have to have very special stories and uh, you know good uh, good scores in your standardized tests. We'll discuss all the tests later, and um, so I, I would say that varies. But if you can be special for the school, they will offer you automatically a merit-based scholarship, which is great. So after you apply, when you have the interview, they will ring you and they'll say, "Hey, John, we would like you know this is uh, someone from Harvard. We would like to tell you that you got in." So yay. Um, plus, we would like to offer you $50,000 scholarship. So the merit-based scholarship is pretty much automatic. Now, some of the schools will also have some kind of specific scholarship or fellowship, and you just have to check every single school. For example, NCA, they're very known for that. Um, they have like 100 different scholarships, and you just have to go through their Excel with all the scholarships, and you're allowed to choose up to four or five and apply to them. Some scholarships can be for Army veterans, it can be from people from certain countries. It can be for women. So the different scholarships, trust me, you're going to uh, uh, be able to apply to at least one or two of them because there's so many. And then you can apply to a specific scholarship. And in these cases, sometimes you get the answer a bit after your acceptance. So it's not necessarily simultaneously with the acceptance. There are one or two other external to the school scholarships. These are uh, rare. 
Uh, two very famous ones would be the Shevening, which are, are scholarships that are given by the British uh, consulate in each country. So whichever country you come from, you can check out Shevening. Uh, again, you have to plan for these scholarships at least two years in advance for these external scholarships because you have to first apply for them. That takes about a year and only then you can apply to the school. Um, Fulbright uh, belongs to Education USA. It's not really the US government, but let's just say it is. And Again, if you're a, a foreigner and you want to go and study in the US, just check out Fulbright and see if that applies, if that's applicable in your country. Again, this takes about two years in advance to apply for. Forte Foundation, a very interesting organization that supports women. And again, uh, lots of resources in that, although Forte work with most of the schools. And if you apply to a school that works with the Forte Foundation and, and you're a woman, you might be eligible through the school for, for a scholarship through the Forte Foundation. Okay, just a few more slides, bear with me, and then I'm gonna answer all your questions. Um, so, you know, great, you know, I really want to do an MBA, but you just showed me it costs $200,000, you know. Is it worth it financially? Okay, I'm sure I'm gonna gain a lot, but is it worth it? So the answer is yes. And I just took this slide from London Business School, and uh, you can see um, a lot of the recruiters here are fantastic recruiters. I'm sure, you know, just try and look at some of the brands. I'm sure you would like to uh, study at some of these brands. And when I do this presentation in front of a crowd, I always kind of ask, is there one, uh, <laughs> is there one company you wouldn't want to work for? And, you know, I'm like a magician. I think I should make the logo a bit bigger, but there's always someone in the first row who says, Burger King, what's that doing here? <laughs> so yeah, I'll make Burger King a bit bigger. So, so everybody shouts Burger King. Um, and, um, so Burger King actually is an amazing position that was last year at London Business School. And um, it's called the Management Rotation Program. And this means that every half a year, you do a different position within Burger King in a different location. And the position isn't um, you know, flipping burgers half a year and then cutting tomatoes half a year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, the position will be half a year working in strategy, half a year working in real estate, half a year working in marketing. And then after uh, half a year working in finance, and then after two years, you'll discuss with your managers, you know, in which department you would like to work in and in which location. This is an amazing position. Now, a lot of these firms have that kind of uh, general management positions for MBAs. So again, um, you know, some of these just big regular firms, okay, like uh, that don't do consulting or don't do finance, will come and recruit MBAs for their future managers. If I look at the salaries, or we already looked at uh, one, uh, um, uh, what was that from the Financial Times? One myth where the highest salary is. Uh, so here's some more stats. They come from different resources. That's why the numbers sometimes are different. And you'll see that on average, the salaries are quite similar between the top 10 MBAs. And although you see in this uh, you know, uh, specific slide that Stanford was, uh, what is it? Oh, actually, it's less than Wharton, right? Wharton is the highest here. With $270 more than, you know, who cares? It's the same salary. It's around $160,000. That's the starting salary. That's before bonuses, before sign up bonus, before stay bonus, before relocation bonus, before getting options at the company. So these are the starting salaries. Again, they're very, very similar. And forget the gaps here. I can tell you, I know people that went to work from Duke and from Kellogg and from Harvard and Google, they all got exact, the exact same salary. Um, and they were working in the same department. You can see here a, a big jump from one year to the three year um, salary. And I think there's two reasons for that. One reason is a lot of these places are very generous with their bonuses and their promotions. So for example, at consulting or investment banking, uh, they will have some kind of up or out um, uh, uh, in their firms, and this upper out kind of means, you know, if you're good, you're going to get up, right? You're going to get a bonus, we're gonna, you're going to get promoted. If you're not good, you know, we're going to kick you out. And, you know, usually MBAs are quite good, so they get a very nice promotion. Um, I think another reason for this kind of salary jump is just because, you know, these numbers come from two sources. <laughs> so I'm not sure how they count each of them, okay? But basically, the salaries are very high, and again, this is... Um, the average base salary before bonuses, et cetera. If we look in Europe, the salaries are very, you know, they're quite similar. And again, if we look at these uh, 160, 170, 150, 
thousand dollars a year base salary before bonuses before anything else and again if you know if something happens in Europe versus the US with foreign currency okay if, you know Trump says you know tweet something and suddenly the euro goes higher and the dollar goes a bit lower the salaries in Europe will be higher and remember that the cost of the MBA in Europe because it was shorter uh, is actually less the cost of living in a lot of places in Europe will be less than you know in expensive places in the US so actually the cost in Europe and the return on investment is much higher than in some of the US programs okay that's just something to remember I just have two or three more slides but I'll address now uh, maybe one of the questions someone asked me about the full-time MBA versus an online MBA now all these slides really um, are talking about the full-time MBA, not an executive MBA, not a part-time MBA, not an online MBA. Can I still do an online MBA and get all these amazing things? Can I come and work at McKinsey and get this high salary? Will I have the same network? Will I have the same benefits? The honest answer is no. <laughs> and um, you won't get the same, you know, if you do a part-time MBA or an online MBA, it won't be the same experience as a full-time two-year MBA. You won't have the same network, you won't get the same things, you won't learn the same things, you won't be able to join all the clubs, you won't be able to be in all the presentations, you won't be able to do the extra activities, which are great, you won't be able to get a summer internship. Um, you might not be able to get the same role that the full-time MBAs receive. And you can check this out because um, there's also statistics for part-time MBAs and online MBAs. Uh, most of the, well, all of the top 10 MBA programs do not have online MBA programs. So they only will have, uh, you know, frontal, full-time or part-time MBAs. They will not have online MBAs. Nevertheless, some people just, you know, don't want to leave their current careers and, um, you know, just want to do an online MBA. There are some good online MBAs. And in that case, it is what you make out of it. So the online MBA gives you a platform and whatever you manage to you know, get out that platform, the better. Um, there's also one or two, uh, something that's called hybrid MBA, which is an online MBA, but you have two or three uh, frontal meetings. Just check out all their options. Again, it's very hard to compare between an online MBA to a full-time MBA, but just to be completely honest, for someone who wants to do a career shift someone who wants to get to the high salary, someone who wants to move a country and wants to go and work in one of these countries where the top MBAs are in, uh, usually the full-time MBA is the way forward. And the online MBA is, is great, but it's just not for career shifters. Okay? So that's, that's my view about online versus um, full-time MBAs. Okay, if we look at uh, what are the top schools are looking for, um, so the top schools are... Um, I usually look for someone who's smart. I know it sounds strange. And how do we, you know, how do I prove if I'm, if I'm smart or not? Um, but yes, we want to show this both in your uh, CV and in your essays, that you're smart, that you can take ownership on, you know, on certain things in your current career, um, that you've had several achievements, etc. Definitely academics is something important. And you can show your academics both in your uh, GMAT and in your uh, undergraduate uh, degree. And, uh, you know, um, it's not the most important thing for MBAs, but that's definitely something important. Um, another thing is school interest. Okay. And I see this a lot with applications. Sometimes people just send me their, you know, application that they didn't do with us and didn't do very smartly, just to be honest. And they show me their application for Columbia, and then they show me their application for London Business School, and guess what? It's the exact same application. And that's a huge mistake. Schools want to see that you're really interested in studying in their program. And the way to show this is to show some school interest, to show that you know a specific course, a specific professor, that there's a reason you want to come to London Business School, because your wife wants to go to the ballet in London. Whatever reason is, you have to show it to London Business School. Another thing is international exposure. Again, not many people have worked in you know, five countries or worked with teams from you know, different countries. But you can show this in any way that you can. If you worked with a team that came from abroad, if you traveled to 10, you know, 10 countries backpacking when you were 18, um, 
any international exposure would be great. Leadership. So a lot of my candidates don't have managerial experience. That's fine. Um, but still, we do advise to show some kind of leadership you know, potential. Um, it can be uh, either from um, uh, your work or it can be from, uh, you know, um, extra curriculum. It can be from university, etc. Broad horizons. This is something important. You don't have to go and volunteer just for the sake of saying, you know, I volunteered somewhere. Uh, but schools are looking for three things. They're looking for academic excellence. They're looking for very interesting professional career progress. And they're looking for something else. That something else can be volunteering. It can be a very interesting hobby. You love cooking for your friends. That's great. That means you're a social person. It can be I ran marathons. Okay, that's great. You know, I haven't run marathons. So they're just looking for that extra thing. And don't be shy about that. Tell the school you know, what that extra thing is. Okay, last slide, I promise. Well, maybe there's one. Um, I think this is the last one. Um, when do we apply? Okay, so if we're looking at 2021, most of the, uh, the European and US schools, the round one application will be in September. That means one year before your studies date. That means in whoever's thinking of 2020, in six weeks, the deadlines are opening. Um, it's really advisable to apply in round one, and there's a lot of advantages in applying early. Most of the schools, the chances of acceptance will actually be quite similar, but it's just, it's just more right to apply early from a project management perspective. So you can apply to the schools you really want to get into. And in, you know, by the end of November, you'll know if you got into them or not. And if you didn't get into them, again, the pessimistic scenario, fine, you still can apply to other schools in round two. But if you go in advance to a, a later round, you know, from a project management perspective, you're going to have to apply to more safer schools and just run this project differently. There are some schools, for example, Columbia, who it's really advised to apply early because they have different incentives, like, like early decision that uh, Duke, Columbia, and Darden have. So it's always advisable to apply as early as possible. And again, as you can see, basically you need to apply a year in advance. Now, application process will act like, for example, with a company like ours, can actually take two or three months. And before that, you have to work on your GMAT. So one more slide that discusses what you need for the school. And that can take three, four months as well. That means if you're thinking of 2021, you should actually be thinking about that today. Probably you should be studying for your GMAT already, finishing with that around April or May, so you can then start working on the applications and be ready to apply in September 2020 for 2021. Okay, last slide. Now I promise. So why why does it take you know two or three months to work on the application? Well, it's just really long. So. There's a couple of prerequisites that you need for any school application. Uh, one of them is, you know, you need a registration fee. Unfortunately, you need to pay around $100 to $200 for each school when you apply, sorry. Uh, most schools will require you to have an undergraduate degree. Uh, again, we actually have every year about two or three candidates that don't have an undergraduate. That's okay with the European schools, um, and that doesn't apply for the US schools. So if by chance you don't have an undergraduate degree, you can still apply to the NCA and London Business School, for example. Um, um, we've, we've seen it done, we've, we've, we've done it. Um, if you don't come from an English speaking country or your undergraduate degree wasn't in English, you will have to do some kind of English test just to show that your English level is adequate. And you can take the TOEFL or the IELTS, uh, which are quite simple English tests. And, um, those, and the, those are the prerequisites. And now you actually have to apply with a few factors. So the first one, actually last year, would be the GMAT or the GRE. Schools don't mind between the two tests. There used to be differences. Right now, all the top schools will accept both of these exams. Well, you need one of them. And if you check out the schools, the, the, the grades in these exams keep going up and up. And the schools are very competitive. And yes, you will need to score quite a high score. So again, the top 10, the top five schools, the average GMAT is around 730 and the GRE, you know, 328. That's very competitive. You can get in with lower scores and I think we kind of specialize in that here at Ringo. But again, score will have to be 
you know, 20, 30, 40 points below average, it can't be 200 points below the average. So you can't get into Stanford with a 400 GMAT. Okay, you have to understand that, that yes, your stories can, you know, um, give you extra credit if they're very interesting, but still the schools will look for some kind of minimum score in the GMAT or GRE. Some of the schools, for example, NCAD or HEC Paris, will have six or seven essays in their application. That can take a while to start thinking about that, writing it, and that can take a while. Uh, every school will ask for the CV, and most of the schools will ask for two recommendations. So you will have to give them recommenders, and the schools will actually ask the recommenders to write for you two recommendations. Again, most of the schools, one or two schools want uh, one recommendation. So it takes a long time. The first school can actually take a month to, to kind of think end to end how I'm going to uh, write the best possible application. And, you know, again, then once you get into a rhythm, it can probably take two or three weeks for every additional school. Um, one question that I can see here is how many schools do I apply to? And I would answer that differently. I would answer that which schools are you applying to? and how difficult they would be for you. So again, contact me, I'll just give you a quick chances assessment. And if I think you have a very good profile and you're applying for uh, safe schools, perhaps two or three schools are you know, enough. If you have a good profile, but applying for very hard, very tough schools to get into, you might want to think of applying to four, five, six, seven schools. So it really depends on you know, how tough the schools are to get into. So that was it. And sorry, I tried to rush through it, but I know that was uh, quite long. I'm going to answer some questions now. I just wanted to say, this is my email. Feel free to send me an email whenever you want. Um, you can check out our website, oringo.com. We also have a chances calculator on our website, so you can see, kind of play around with that. We have lots of information there. Um, and again, you can always shoot me an email. I love CVs. When someone shoots me an email, please send me your CV or LinkedIn profile first. So I can just get to know you and then I can answer your questions in the best possible. So again, I'm just gonna kind of quickly answer some questions that uh, were asked throughout the presentation. Uh, one question was about online and another question was about part-time MBAs. So I'll quickly answer that. I think I did, but I'll quick, quickly answer that. I would say that a part-time MBA or an online MBA are very good experiences. The studies are very similar to full-time MBAs, but, uh, the, for career switchers and for people who want to move to another country, people who want to utilize their entire school, you know, foundation infrastructure. You want, you want to go to career services. You want to get, you know, lots of stuff. For those kind of people, the full-time MBA experience would be, you know, a, a better experience. Obviously, costs more and you know, maybe tough. Um, another question was. Um, Okay, um, so someone's asking about using a tutor versus preparing by myself. So I'm not sure if you're referring to, a, to the GMAT or referring to the actual application, but I'll try and answer both. Most people use tutors, okay? And for example, let's think about the GMAT, okay? One option is to buy a book and to try and read through the book. Whoever's seen the GMAT book, it's quite big. And another option is, you know, to take an online course. And the third option would be to take a class or a private tutor. Now, the private tutor might teach you the same thing from the book, but you know he's been doing it for a while and he knows how to teach you. So there might be there some kind of benefit. I'm not a GMAT tutor, but I definitely see the benefit there. Same thing with, for example, an MBA admission consulting uh, consultant who, you know, we've been doing this for 15 years and we work with about 300 candidates a year. We, we know what the schools are looking for. So it's hard for me to, to duplicate someone and say, go and study on, you know, go and try and apply by yourself to Colombia and apply with me and we'll see the differences. But I think we add a bit of value and then uh, that bit of value might be the difference between acceptance and acceptance with the scholarship for you. So, or not getting accepted and getting accepted. So yeah, I do see a bit of value. Again, I'm biased, but, you know, I definitely see value in, in using, you know, a tutor and, and a consultant. Uh, I think there was a question throughout the, the presentation. What are the qualities that the schools are looking for? Um, and, and, and this is a fantastic question. I love it. What's the ideal profile? What's the ideal candidate that schools are looking for? And the answer is, there isn't an ideal profile. 
and the schools are looking for diverse classes. And last year, I actually had this uh, candidate, I loved him, uh, and uh, he was a lawyer, which is not so good, uh, for various reasons, but he worked in a startup that created energy from sea waves. Now, that's interesting, right? And, it, you know, that was the first candidate that worked in a, in a company that creates energy from sea waves that I saw in my five years at the Ringo. And I see, I see around a thousand profiles a year. Okay, so um, I think that that's pretty special. And I told him he had, you know, a 660 GMAT, which is mediocre. I told him, no, we're going for the top schools. And he got interviews at Kellogg, MIT, and Duke, and he got into Duke with an internship. And the reason is that was a very special profile. Now, I can't go and tell you go and work in a startup with a C wave energy, right? That's very specific. But I just want to tell you that the schools aren't looking for a specific profile. They're looking for you know someone who's different, someone who ex is excellent in what they do, and you're just going to have to prove that to the school. Remember that the schools have a very tough time. They need to compare an accountant to a consultant, to a lawyer, to a professional athlete. How do they do this? Well, that's a tough job. You just try and see that they were very good at what they did, and if you're very good at what you do, a plus you know have uh, proof quantifiable proof for this. So you have great achievements and your recommenders will support that and you have good test results and you write a you know kick ass application, you'll have a good chance in the top school. Uh, another question is if I already have a master's degree, okay, can it make a difference when applying? So um, I really like that. Um, and usually, again, like this comes very nicely with the, you know, with the previous question that was asked, you know, what are schools looking for? And their answer is they're just looking for people who are really good and kind of better or, you know, different than their colleagues. And if you have a master's degree and, you know, it was an interesting master's degree and it goes together with your entire story, okay, so you work in an investment bank, you have, you know, your undergraduate degree in economics, and your master's degree in finance, okay, that makes sense. And now you want an MBA, well, that's that's a huge advantage, okay? Uh, what I don't see as an advantage is people who have another MBA program. And I get quite a lot of applicants who have a previous MBA program. Usually it's a, you know, part-time MBA program. Usually it's not from a top school, and they want to go and do a top 10 MBA program. Schools don't always like that. And I think that is actually a disadvantage or, you know, that that's definitely not an advantage. And I definitely realize that the word MBA is probably the only common thing between a part time MBA and a you know, not very good college versus a top 10 MBA. Uh, very two different experiences, but still schools, you know, don't like that that much. So I would uh, maybe that's something that I would, you know, uh, be a bit worried about. Um, so another question is, again, popular question, uh, visas in the US, okay? Um, and this is, a, this is a very concerning uh, question for a lot of foreigners who want to go and study in the US. Uh, so the honest answer is, I don't know, okay? Uh, there's smarter people than me that don't know what's gonna happen with the Brexit and don't know what's gonna happen with Donald Trump. Um, not in two, three years, they don't know what's gonna happen next week. So it's hard for me to tell what's gonna change with the visas. What I do think that's gonna happen is not much. And the reason is the MBA graduates go to very high earning positions that pay a lot of taxes to these countries, okay? And the, the, you know, the, the employers, okay, are very powerful employers such as Google or Amazon, uh, who also have a lot of connections, and they really need these managers. So again, remember that uh, on the one hand, maybe there's some forces who say we don't want uh, foreigners in our country, but on the other hand, we, we actually need them for our economy. So I don't think there's gonna be a, a huge change in terms of visas in the future. Um, I don't think classes are gonna grow or, or go smaller or diminish. I, I just don't see that happening. Um, so yes, there's a very slight diminish in the number of applications to some of the US schools. By the way, not in all the top 10 US schools, but maybe in lower ranked schools. But this is from various reasons and not necessarily just visa. And again, 
we're talking about uh, a very small percentage uh, of decrease, which is again less than five, a few percent. So um, I don't see a huge change in this. And uh, again, I still think there'll always be demand for top ten uh, graduates. Um, so those are the questions I saw so far. If you have any more questions, I'm always happy to answer them. Um, you have my email, and again, I, I'm always happy to answer personal questions. Send me your CV first. Um, and an MBA is a great experience. I really think it, uh, it, it's a life-changing experience. If you're thinking about it, you know, read a bit more about it, prepare in advance, and just go for it. Thanks a lot for hosting me. Um, that was it for me. Thanks very much.